navigating the Christian life, I want you to go ahead and turn to Exodus 14 and 8. I don't usually do this, but there's two things that God's really impressed upon my heart and I want you to be praying about. It. Next week, I'm going to start a new series. The new series is going to be on racism. As you can imagine what a touchy subject that is in our nation, but there's probably no more needed a subject that we need to stop and look at and address. Uh, so you need to be praying for me and uh, praying for our country, our community. We're going to advertise it and be praying that God will draw people in. Because as believers, as people who have been washed in the blood of Christ, there should be a difference. So we're going to begin in this series looking at the heart of God. Then we're going to go through and look at some realities of history that we're probably not going to be too proud of or like. And you know what else I've discovered as I have delved into this issue? The issue that's plaguing our nation, destroying our nation? Everyone's racist. Regardless of color, creed, or background. But then we're going to end up in the series of the cross, which is the cure Amen. for all sin. Amen. All right? Amen. So I want you to be praying for that. And here's the other thing that I want you to be contemplating and praying for this week. <clears throat> You may have forgotten, but just a few short months ago, you know, why are we bringing these baskets in and praying on them? Because we're asking for real blessings on our teachers and our students. And you say, well, listen, we, we, you know, there's a lot of bad things going on in the county. It, it doesn't affect our, our lives. There's a lot of bad things going on in the country, rather. It doesn't affect our county. Just a few short months ago, Student was arrested at middle at Fair Oak Middle School, bringing in a machete, and he had a list of students' names in which he intended to take out. And some of your teenagers in this place today were on that list. You didn't know that, did you? They didn't tell you that in the news. Our teachers need our prayers. They need God's intervention. So next week, as we put those baskets down here, we're going to be praying for God to move. All right? Well, let's look here as we navigate the Christian life. This is part two. So as I'm going to do a little bit of review, and then we're going to go. What we did last week is we looked at, at how God works. And here's the thing that you, you need to remember. Write this down somewhere. It's going to be important. You're going to say, what did the preacher preach on? Platform? About what? Now, about 30, 35, 40 minutes. And you're not going to remember what you need to know Monday or Tuesday. Here's what you need to know. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know in both of these sermons. It doesn't matter if you can't understand or see the future. What matters is God does. Amen. That's what matters. But last week we looked at how God does and how God operates. We kind of looked at things from God's perspective. We're going to go a little deeper this week. This week is the how-to, the applying part. And this is what do you do at a roadblock? How do you make it through the desert? We're going to look at some practical things this week. But last week what we were looking at is we were looking at the Israelites. They had been in bondage for over 400 years. They had been slaves to the Egyptians. And God called them out. God delivered them. Brought them out of bondage. Said, I have a land for you flowing in milk and honey and blessings. He named them. He, he made them his special people. Their slavery was, was terrible. But God freed them. Took them out. Took them into the desert. And said, I'm taking them to you to a paradise. A little old paradise. And then he began to take them in circles. He, he began to take them in circles and around and around and around in the desert. Instead of going from point A to point B, which was the shortest way, the quickest way, he, brought them, he took them in circles. And as they were going in circles, then finally God spoke. And he said, all right, I want you to go to this particular place. Camp right here. Down to the, the Red Sea. The big red sea with all the big mountains on the back on both sides of it. And, and there I'm going to speak. But he didn't just do that. He gave them his spirit. 
He gave them a manifestation of his spirit. It was a cloud by day and fire by night to lead them. Same way he gives every believer personally his Holy Spirit to live within you. And his word, the map to guide you. But yet, they came to a roadblock. And as you live life desiring and trying to follow God, there are going to be times in your life when you come to a roadblock. Where there seems to be absolutely no direction to go in. There in Exodus 14, 8, look what it says with me. The Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped at the sea by Baharath in front of Bel Savan. That's Bible language for they're at the Red Sea, they had monstrous mountains on every side, and coming up behind them was Pharaoh's army to destroy them. Remember, we talked about it? You know, all the frogs, all the things, the mosquitoes, all those cool things came to the Egyptians. Finally, they had enough, and they gave them taxi money and said, Get out of our, our, our country. You're ruining it. We can't stand it anymore. Then Pharaoh got up next day, walked out onto his balcony, and he heard a strange, eerie sound he had never, ever heard. Silence. Two million slaves they had let escape. That morning... When all the Egyptians put their trash out on the curb, nobody to pick it up. But when the foreman got to work at the job site to finish the spence, there was nobody to work. And all the Egyptians said, we have really made a bad mistake. And so they began to pursue the freed God's chosen people. And so here's God's chosen people. They did exactly what God told them to do. Now, now think about it. They're walking in circles with their holy iPhones and they're listening to that woman's voice telling them, you know, three-tenths of a mile, take a right, and right into a roadblock. Google Maps led them right into a roadblock. And they, couldn't, they didn't have anywhere else to turn, anywhere else to go. And yet, they weren't mistaken because it was the very Spirit of God the cloud that led them and God spoke to Moses and he specifically told them to go there. Yet it was closed. Then look at verse 9 of chapter 14. Well, we read that, but think about this. They're at the Red Sea. Now, now listen. There are those liberal scholars who don't believe the Bible's the word of God that would tell you this was the creek. And that they walked right on through this creek about ankle to knee deep. <clears throat> I guarantee you if it was a creek, they wouldn't have waited on God to splat right through it when they saw it in the Egyptian army coming at them. The point of the story is that they were at a roadblock and they could not cross the Red Sea. They could not go up the mountains. And the Egyptian army, destruction, desolation, desperation, despair, the same things you experience in life when you hit a roadblock. Situations out of your control. They were in a bad spot. What's interesting is God led them to this spot. And this is where it will help some. They hadn't sinned. They were not out of God's will. When things come to us, and it makes life come to a screeching halt, we talked about the road signs of sin last week. If there's sin in your life, you immediately, here, here's what I noticed. When I hit a roadblock, and there's desperation and destruction and despair coming up on me, my sin list gets real short. I don't need people to point out my sins. Amen. That's not what was going on here. God had brought them to this roadblock for a purpose, for a reason. God had led them to this dead end. Look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 14. They said to Moses, 
Is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So what they do, they trust God, right? No. They do the exact same thing we do. They didn't trust God. What they did was they said, Moses, you got us lost. And what they really said was, God, you got us lost. But they were not lost. Look at verse 2 again, chapter 14. It says, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Bai Harath, between Midigo and the sea, in front of Bel Zavon. You shall encamp facing the sea. God told them to encamp at that exact spot. Why? Verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. God had a reason. And when you're navigating the Christian life and you're serving God and you're in love with God and you're following God and you hit a roadblock in your life that you didn't put up, neither nor did you choose, you have to understand the truth. I'm not talking about some pokey, 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 positive thinking. I hate this ideal out there. Send positive thoughts my way. Send Jesus my way. You can keep Amen. your positive thoughts. Amen. Why? Why? God had a reason. <coughs> Here's principle number three. God always has a reason for our roadblocks. You need to hold on to this. Because when it's a God roadblock, you can't get around it. Okay? But God has his reasons for our roadblocks. What's the reason? Let me give you some reasons why God gives roadblocks in our lives. Here's the first one. When the only direction we can turn is God. They ran straight into a roadblock, into a dead end. And when we do that, that's when we learn to trust God. Remember last week, we said there's going to be times when mom and dad can't help you in a roadblock. There's going to be times when your spouses can't help you in a roadblock. I have one of the most dedicated wives you'll ever meet. And when God ran me into one particular roadblock for two and a half years, she was useless. Wasn't for lack of trying. But God put me in a roadblock but no, where nobody but God could help me. And you're going to find out that your preacher don't have the answers nor the directions around the roadblock. Remember we said medical medicine and science? Just won't be able to help you through some of the roadblocks that God, that God will lead you to. God, and listen, this is the truth that a lot of people will not preach to you and tell you. And then when you live it, you begin to question God and his goodness. Don't ever question, well, you don't ever have to question God's goodness. Yeah. But you won't know that until you get a roadblock. God led them to a place of desperation. That's true. Your loving God that you serve and surrender to will at times lead you to a place of desperation. And you have to, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you will question God's goodness. You will question His faithfulness. You know what? That's why I beg you Sunday in and Sunday out. I'm not against technology, but a good old-fashioned Bible that's highlighted and marked up, 
and you hit a roadblock, and you're going to go back to the mat, man, I'm going to tell you, that's what helps me. When you hit a roadblock, go back to the mat. Because comfort's found in the mat. The answer to what you're going through, it's in the mat. God's directions, his answer, it's in the mat. Look at verse 13 and 14. Read that with me. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Stop, underline that. A lot of enemies got used to grow the, Egypt, the Israelites, but never the Egyptians again. You know why? He destroyed them that same day. Verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. And you only have to be, what's that word? <laughs> Stand still. Trust God. See God move. Just be quiet. Why does God lead you to roadblocks? Is it to destroy you? Why does God not just allow desperation? Why does God lead you to desperation? Principle number four. Because when you have exhausted all other avenues and hell's not on your heels, God leads you to a roadblock because of this principle right here. I can stand still and trust God to save you. You know what happens then? Do you know what happens when you stand still and when you trust God? Look in verse, if you will, verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Look up here. They hit a roadblock. And God spoke to Moses and said, Look, tell the people to stand still. That's what he's going to do. Stand still. See God's salvation. Be silent and trust me. And once you do those things, God said, Go forward. Now look up here for a second. What do we do right up to the point where we stand still, be quiet, trust God? What are we doing up until that point? I ain't being ugly. I'm just asking. We're, we're squirming. We're manipulating. We're doing everything we can to dig under the roadblock. To go around the roadblock. Climb over the roadblock. Right? Yeah. But notice. Listen to me. Write this in your Bible in the margin. If you didn't bring one. Or type it in your iPad there. You won't see God move and you be able to go forward until you stand still and trust God. So when you run into a closed road and you're just running in circles, here's a couple things to remember. You might want to write down a few of these. Number one, don't be afraid. No matter what, Jesus is enough. Amen. You may, as I talked about last week, you might look at me and say, hey, but you don't understand, preacher. How could you know where I am? And just like I told you last week, some of you know some things about me and some of you don't. I've gone through those periods of depression. I've had nearly six suicides in my immediate family. And there are things that are darker than that that you don't know, and I pray you never know. Roadblocks in my life. But there's never been a time when Jesus wasn't enough. I told you my wife wasn't enough, despite her best efforts. My friends fell far short. All my efforts. But Jesus was enough. Number two, stand still. 
What is it all about? I notice this about believers. We very little trust God or depend on God, and we a lot are about the business of religion, right? When you hit a roadblock, you can no longer manipulate the circumstances. Cultural Christianity loses when you hit a roadblock. Then you come to the point where you figure out, is there really a God? Can I trust Him? It's more than just the perfect attendance. It's more than you ought to go to church because you're supposed to. When you hit these roadblocks, God verifies that He's real. Amen. And a roadblock. And, and I know, it's hard to focus on God for your heart beating and all the other things, all the things... Your roadblock may not look like mine. There's a lot of different roadblocks. Some psychological, some physical, some, there's just all kinds. But listen, focus on Him. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Look at the map. Don't forget to stand still. Number three, witness God's salvation. Notice God told them in verse 13 how to deal with the problem. Before it happened. Trust God. I mean, think about it. It was Noah who built the ark before it ever rained. It had never, ever rained on the earth. Then there's the three Hebrew children. They trusted God at their roadblock. And when they were thrown into the fire, who came to deliver it. The fourth man was Jesus Christ himself. In the fire. You say, well, mine may not be that dramatic, preacher. Well, it may not be that dramatic, but it won't be answered any other way except to trust Jesus. To stand still and witness the salvation of God. You see, God was teaching them to trust him. Let me teach you a biblical principle. This will help you. I hear all kinds of people say, listen, I'm trying to grow my faith. I'm trying to have great faith, big faith, large faith. I hear preachers preach on it. Let me give you a biblical truth. You have all the faith you're ever going to have now. Romans tells us God gives you the amount of faith that you have. Here's the issue with where you are. The issue is always not how much faith you have, but in whom you Trust. place it. Trust. Where do you put that faith? You see, if I was able to grow my faith, morph my faith, work out my faith, build up my faith, I could brag about it. But God gives you the amount of faith you're going to have, but the question is always where do you put it? into yourself, into your abilities, into your bank account, into your education, into your future, into your past, into your connections? Or do you put it in Jesus? That will help you if you'll always remember that's what this is about. That's what roadblocks are about. Remember Jesus said you had the faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain? He was trying to teach you the biblical truth that Paul understood that is, the issue is not how much faith I have. The issue is where have I placed my faith. Number four, go forward. Look at verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. And you only have to be silent. God didn't act until they stood still. That's very important. Until they stood still and trusted God, he didn't act. Romans 4, 17, Paul tells us that we serve a God, now listen, who calls those things which are not as though they were. Until they stood still and trusted God, God made those things that were not true. 
You see, we serve a God that does part of seeds. What is it that you need to trust God with? Your soul, your family, your career, your future? What is it that you, that God's calling you to trust Him with? Here comes the second part, hearing God in the desert. All right? God parts the Red Sea. God takes them on through the Red Sea. And as you go to chapter 15, there's an incredible celebration. I mean, think about it. God opens the Red Sea. He carries two million slaves through to the other side. He closes the Red Sea and destroys their enemy right there. It's pretty incredible. So the first 15 verses or so of chapter 15, they begin to sing. And even at a roadblock, what you find here, God's still leading you. Man, I've been at roadblocks before, and it felt like, as the old Christians used to say, that heaven was, was, was brass, or heaven was frozen over, and I couldn't hear anything from God. God's still leading at roadblocks. Then they see a mighty move of God. They see Him. Out. See, what they realize is they're not lost. What they realized was even better is God's not lost when he parted the Red Sea and let them through. That was the reassuring thing for them. And so they see their salvation. They see God move on their behalf. They realize that God's not lost and he doesn't have the wrong map. Look at verse 22 of chapter 15. This is what it says. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. But then God led them through there back into the desert. So they went to the other side back into the desert. And that's our next lesson. Deserts are training places. You see, that's the real Christian life, isn't it? There's this valley, this lowness. Down where we think we're at the roadblock and it couldn't get any worse, God delivers us. And I've noticed it in my life, you'll see it too. They go up on the mountain, they go over the problem, you get through this problem, and it seems like the bottom falls out. And then you kind of covet, you're like the children of Israel. You're thinking, boy, I hate this misery. I'd like to have the old misery back and learn how to deal with it. Amen? And so God takes them out of the desert and they're marching through the desert and they're still marching around in the desert and there's no water. You kind of imagine that you're out on a trip. I don't have to imagine. When, when Austin and I left and went uh, down to uh, different places in Florida, this was our trip. The air conditioner didn't work in the car. We were in the middle of the hottest time of summer. It was over 100 plus all around the nation. And we get to a motel, we go in, and it's hotter in the motel than it was out in the car driving around in the middle of the day. You get there, just imagine you're at one of those, those kinds of motels, you know, where you lay in the bed and you're scared. And you're trying to figure out where not to lay on a roach, you know. <laughs> and then you turn the water on and there's no water. You can't get cold water. You can't get a refreshing shower. So you got two million people marching out in the desert. They're marching around. God has just delivered them from their enemy with swords. And they get thirsty. You see, when God leads you through a roadblock, He's going to take you through a time of dryness after the roadblock. So God leads them out in the desert. But there's a purpose for that too. There's a purpose for that too. Here's the next principle. Deserts have a purpose. I write this down in my Bible, and if I didn't have a Bible with me, I'd put it in my book and go home, buy a Bible and put it in the Bible because you'll need this later. Deserts have a purpose. Remember, it wasn't because they'd sinned, nor was it because they were lost. So what's the purpose, preacher? Look at verses 23 through 25 of chapter 15. And when they came to Mar, which means bitterness, they could not drink the water of Mar because it was bitter. Therefore it was named Mar. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? 
And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him all. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Stop right there. Do you know what's happening here? When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water before it was bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, what shall we drink? Do you know what's happening here? They were being tested. God was testing them. God was testing them to see what was in their hearts. Now this is, this is pretty important. Why would God do that? Why did God test them? There in verse 22 it says, Then Moses made Israel sit out in the Red Sea, and they, God made them. It said God took them there. God was testing them. Why would God test you? You know, I don't know about you. I know things change over time. But I can remember as a child growing up testing an automobile. And uh, when I test an automobile, I go out. Used to be they let you take the car out for a while. Used to be they let you take it out overnight. That's long gone. But when I take an automobile out to test it, I don't know about you, but I'm going to see what she'll say. Why is that? It's the very same reason that automobile manufacturers test their vehicles' limits before they sell them to you. You know, I had this truck, and I'd saved up and saved up and saved up and saved up for years and years and years and found an incredible deal on the truck. And the guy worked in there, or the guy that owned the lot was, he, he was one of our deacons, not here, and gave me an incredible deal on the truck. But he had never, he just bought the truck, had it cleaned up, never driven it. Never driven it. Brought him the check in to buy and pay off the truck. He said, you want to test drive it? I said, no, nah, I trust you. My wife said, we'll drive it. <laughs> Got in, truck, hit 95, rode the hammer down, and <laughs> boom, we were broke down on the side of the road. I mean, like, I could almost turn around and see the car dealer ship from where we were. Why does God test us? You know, you think, well, if he's God, Pastor, why does he have to test us? He tests you to see the contents of your heart. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he's God, doesn't he know the contents of our heart? It's not for you. Or it's not for him. It's for you. He already knows the contents of your heart, but do you know the contents of your heart? Do you really know where you are with God? That's the point of testing. You know, it's great that we can look back in the Bible and God's going to tell us why he tested them. Write this down in the margin there. Don't, don't flip it. Just listen. Let me read it to you. It's Deuteronomy 8.2. In Deuteronomy 8.2, God tells us exactly what was going on as he took them through the Red Sea into Marah, into the desert there. The bitterness of the dry desert. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments. <clears throat> See, God already knows what's in our heart. The problem is, sometimes we deceive ourselves. God was testing them to really show them where their faith was. To show them who they were trusting. To show them who they were following. You know, when it comes to God's test, here's what we've all grown accustomed to. We've all grown accustomed to going and studying, getting prepared, and then going and sitting down in the classroom. And what happens next? We've studied for however long the teachers prepped us, the teachers told us to study this, and the teachers told us all these things. And so we study all the answers, then we go take the test, right? This will help you. God doesn't work that way. The way that God works is he gives the test and later in life you go learn the answers. God 
God gives us the test, and then he gives us the answers, and then the learning, growing part of life occurs. You know what else that means? Every one of you in here has a test with your name on it. Everybody here has a test with your name on it. You say, oh no, listen, God did test me. And I feel miserably, preacher. If you're in good company, they did too. There it tells us in Exodus 15, 1 through 21, they wrote songs about Moses. They, they worshipped, they paraded when they crossed through the Red Sea. Then they went into the desert of Marah, and then they began to curse Moses and God. Now think about it. Moses was the greatest leader they'd ever known. And then all of a sudden, he was a moron. All of a sudden, God was great and trustworthy. And then they were saying, well, God's, God's lost again. Kind of like us, did yeah. We're on top of the mountaintop. God's so sweet. He's so good. And when you're in the middle of the desert, the dry, bitter desert, we get angry. We get mad at God. But you know, God's big enough to take that. What God's doing is testing us, and he's going to give us the answers. He's going to show us. Down to chapter 16, verse 8. Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to full, because the Lord has heard your grumblings, that you grumble against him. What are your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Here's something that's really, really important. Moses moved from the greatest leader to a moron. God went from the sweetest thing they'd ever known to untrustworthy. You know what Moses was saying there? He was warning them against one of the worst sins in all the Bible. You know what it is? Complaining. Complaining. A complainer is what the Bible calls a practical atheist. A practical Christian atheist. What is a Christian? What, what's a practical Christian atheist, Pastor? Well, you know, you, we've all seen them. I've seen bunches of them over the years. They're the same ones that you, they love God, they trust God, they see God do a mighty thing, and then you hit the desert, the dry time, and they complain to God because they got muddy feet because they went through the Red Sea. Listen. When you're in a dry time, beware of the sin of complaining. It's very, very, very dangerous. And God takes it very, very serious. Here's one of the greatest lessons that you'll ever learn. Teenagers, when you're complaining about your parents, guess what? God gave you those parents. When you're complaining about your teacher, when you're complaining about your preacher, when you're complaining about your boss, God gave you them to lead you through this desert. When the Israelites were complaining about Moses, Moses said, guys, y'all really complaining about God. Let me explain it so you'll understand it a little bit better. Do you know that God sees complaining as seriously as he does idolatry and sexual sin? Jot down in the margin there, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Don't turn, just let me read it to you. It should be on the screen. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13 says. This is how destructive the sin of complaining is to you and those around you. God considers it as bad. Sexual fornication. Adultery. Idolatry. Listen to what it says there. For I do not want you to be unaware. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. Unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He's saying, listen, our fathers had the, the, the Spirit of God witnessing to them. God leading them through these terrible times. And he said, for us, this was a lesson. And all passed 
the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God wasn't pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. And you don't want to fail the test to be overthrown. Do not be idolaters. Listen to what it says in verse 6. Now these things took place as examples, lessons for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat, drink, rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality. As some of them did, almost did it. Alright? And we must not put Christ to the test. As some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, a lesson to us. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let everyone who thinks he stands. Take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you. It is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. Now do you understand that verse that's so misquoted? God's not going to take away the desert. He's going to take you through the desert. He's going to lead you through the desert. But the sin of complaining is you saying, I don't trust God, nor do I trust God's map. I'm going to do it all on my own. And I promise you, if you fall into that sin, that's what you're doing. You're doing it on your own. And friend, go back and read and learn the lesson from the Israelites. That doesn't work out. When you set off on your own, that doesn't work out very well. Paul is warning them not to fall in the same old sin that destroyed so many. With all they had going on, all that was taking place, they were complaining about Moses' leadership, God's presence. Why did they complain? It's a lack of faith. Complaining equals a lack of faith. Because what you're saying is you don't trust God to intervene in your circumstances. Would God have brought them through the Red Sea to let them die in the desert? Would Jesus come from heaven, walk this earth, suffer the way he suffered, sacrifice for you, die on the cross to let you die in the desert? Listen to what Romans 8.32, you might want to put this down in your margin too. I know it's a lot of scripture, but man, when you're walking through the desert and you want to hear God speak to you, this is a good one. Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? <coughs> Complaining is a terrible sin because it's the sin of unbelief. And there's no cures to the thirst you have or the disillusionment or the despair by complaining. It doesn't help. Not questioning, complaining. There's usually two types of people in the church or there's two types of Christians. There are those that complain There are those who know how to pray. Those that complain and those that know how to play. Listen, God always has a plan. Listen to what God told Moses to do. He said, Moses, I want you to go over there, take that tree, throw it into the bitter waters. See, they had water, but they couldn't drink it. It was bitter. It was poison. And he said, Moses, take that tree, that, that log, and throw it in the water. And what did God do? made the water sweet. 
Look up here for a second. If you're at a roadblock, if you're in the desert, you need to learn this lesson. The whole time they were looking there in Mar, at that bitter water, oh, I mean, think about it, how, how terrible that was to be so thirsty, legitimately thirsty and dying of, of thirst and heat and see water that you couldn't drink as poison. The whole time they were complaining, they're probably sitting down on the wall. The answer to God's prayer was already there. God didn't react to their situation. He had the law there before they got there. He didn't say, poof, Moses, get that log. The Bible is very clear that he said, Moses, the cure to your problem is right there beside him. God already had a plan. God has a plan for you. God always has a plan. Do you understand what he's, what he's trying to teach them? The key to what they needed was the same thing I said 15 minutes ago. Jesus is the answer. Do you know why he took a, a long piece of wood, threw it in the water, the bitter waters? Because it was a symbol, it was a picture of Jesus Christ. Picture of Jesus Christ. That's right, Jeremiah 23, 5, it says that Jesus was the righteous branch. Then the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, it reminds us that he died. God, Christ was a curse. He was a curse on a tree for us. Listen to me. Do you know why your professors, do you know why your friends don't understand the Old Testament? Because Jesus is the interpreter and the key to the Old Testament. He always was there. Even if your eyes wasn't open to see him, he always was the answer and he always will be the answer. You can't understand the Old Testament without Jesus. You take it away, there's no Old Testament. I hear people in another well meaning. They'll come and say, listen, this person believes the Old Testament or this person is this, this person is that. But if you don't, Understand Jesus because he is the key of the Old Testament. Nothing makes sense nor is important to die. What God was doing was teaching them that when they were in this dry, bitter, desperate place to turn to him. No matter what you're going through, no matter what it is, there is no answer. No other answer other than Jesus Draw closer to him. That's why God said, draw close to me, and I'll draw close to you. God tests us. He tests us to show us who we're really trusting in. Because if you're trusting in your own wits, your own ability, your own stamina, your own strength, your own fortune, your own, all these things, it's always going to let you down. But you see, God always has plan for your life. And it's always the best. To see, here's the thing that you don't understand. You say, well, why is God testing me? Because when you're not trusting in Jesus, you're not following the map. You're going in your own direction. And, and you don't have the best plan. God's tests are really loving ways of correcting you. You know, you've taken a long turn on GPS. What does it say? Recalculating. God's tests are his way of recalculating you spiritually. Everybody, <coughs> preacher, that was good. Y'all all right this morning, y'all? <laughs> That's what they are. It's not an angry God. He's recalculating you back onto his plan. You know, what's interesting is it gets even better. While they were stomping around in the dust and the dirt and sand and they couldn't see the tree that God had for them there, they couldn't see the answer to the prayer that they were, they were complaining about. You know what's taking place? Now literally, this is the Bible. This is the truth. This is how it works. They're standing in Mark. And they're stomping around. They've, they've raised up a dust storm. And they're complaining about being thirsty. 
And they're saying, God, you promised us the land flowing with milk and honey. Now you want us to die in the desert. Here's the law. But there's even more. There's even more. Look what it says in 1527. When they came to Elam, where they were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. <clears throat> what does that mean, preacher? Here's Mara, a bitter place of bitterness. Here's Eden. You just read how many palm trees it had, how many springs it had. It's an oasis, isn't it? You know the irony. Here's Mara. Right here is Eden. I mean, like, standing in one side of the, the river there, on 123, looking over into Pickens on the other side of the river. That's where they were. They're standing in Mara complaining about God, and, and they literally, if they hadn't kicked up, go look at a map. They hadn't kicked up so much dirt because they were trolling around complaining about God. They could have seen the palm trees and the springs over here. God was leading them. God never is lost. God never does not have a plan for your life. The question is, are you going to let him lead you? Lead you in his plan? I, kind of a history buff, and one of my favorite men in history is, is a Christian man, Sosanese, back in World War II. You've heard me say this before, but in World War II, the Russians killed more of their own people than the Nazis killed of the Jews. And we all know how horrific the murders of the Jews were by the Nazi Germany. But think about this for a second. The Russians took their people of faith because Russia was and is, I care what Facebook said, is an atheist state. And so all the Christians, they shipped off to Siberia and put them in dead camps, even as equally as bad and worse than the death camps of the Nazi Germans. So Stephen was one of those men of faith that was shipped to Siberia. There in Siberia, he was tortured. And he said, literally, he said, in mind and body, and all of you, some of you know that the mind torture can sometimes be worse than the body torture, right? The physical torture. And there he was tortured and so tortured in his mind and his body that it got so bad that he just couldn't take it anymore. And he came up with a quote unquote, he said, a suicide. Plan. He mapped out a plan to commit suicide to escape the torture that he was under. And so he put it together through painstaking plan. He began to go through that plan. And the day that he was to take his life, he was out on the yard. And that was the day he was going to set this plan into motion and see it through. Sister so Stephen recounts that while he was out in the yard, he was there and he had that, that look. He said, a fellow believer walked by, gazed into his eyes, recognized it, walked over to Sosanethan, and Sosanethan sat on the ground. Right in front of Sosanethan, he drew a cross in the dirt. And he looked up at Sosanethan and walked off the mountain. <coughs> So Sanethan said that that cross in the dirt reminded me of the joy and the hope that is in Christ. And he said, I decided to trust Christ and not commit suicide that day. But a week later, so Sanethan was liberated and flown to Geneva, Switzerland. From Geneva, Switzerland, and I quote, this is what he said. To think I was about to commit suicide, and within a week 
I would be a free man. I, I don't know what roadblock that you're at. Maybe you're in the desert. But what I know is, is the joy in Jesus is enough. Amen. <coughs> What I know is, no matter what desperate place you're in, and you might think that God has abandoned you, yeah. See, here's the cure. God has not abandoned you. God's not lost. God's math is correct. You don't have to know all the terms and directions for your future. You just have to trust that God can. That's enough. Would you bow your heads with us? This morning, the most important thing you'll ever do is trust God with your heart. The most important thing you'll ever do is trust God with your future. And so I want to ask you this morning, has there ever been a time in your life where that you have placed your faith in Jesus, where you've surrendered your heart to Jesus where you're trusting Him with your eternity. Have you ever done what we call giving your heart to Jesus to be saved? If you have never, with nobody looking around, everybody praying, if you've never, if you've never trusted Jesus with your future, with your future, with your eternity, where you will spend eternity, if you've never done that, and you want to this morning, would you raise your hand? Nobody's looking around, just me, so I can pray for you. Just raise your hand, put it up, put it down. Raise it enough to where I can see it. All right, thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to come back. Maybe this morning you've trusted the Lord with your life, but you've never trusted Him with baptism. You've never trusted Him to join a church and to commit to be discipled and serve. Maybe you need to do that this morning. But maybe this morning you've done all those things. You've trusted with your heart, your life. You've been baptized. You've joined the church and you're serving. But you're in a dry, bitter place. Maybe even those around you would never know it. Maybe it's obvious. And this morning, what I'm telling you is Jesus is enough. With nobody looking around, if that's you, and you say, Preacher, this morning, I need you to pray for me for strength and wisdom as I go through this roadblock or this dry place. If that's you, with nobody looking around, please don't look around. Let people raise their hands. If that's you, would you raise your hand this morning? All right. Anybody else? What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to pray for y'all. I'm going to invite the person to raise their hand to give their heart to Jesus to do that this morning. But I'm going to ask my deacons that are not serving right now to come to the altar. And those of you that raised your hand, that you're in a dry place, I'm going to pray for you in your seat. But I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and go forward trusting God. Come to the altar and let one of our deacons or our leaders pray with you. the person that needed to accept Christ. Do it. So what do you mean, Pastor? Do it. Listen. I'll lead you through. I'll tell you how. But you have to do it. You have to ask Him. You have to stand still and say, God, I can't save myself. God, I need you to do in my heart what I can't do. And you have to surrender your life. You have to surrender your heart and your future to Him this morning. He will change you forever. If that was you this morning, then just pray. Just say, Lord, now you're praying, not me. Lord, I'm asking you to come into my heart to transform my desires, my future, and my life. God, God I surrender my life to you. Lord, I'm asking you to say, do what you wish with my future. For those that raise their hands and we're in the dark, 
desolate, bitter place. Church, let's all pray for them right now. I'm going to ask them, as I pray for everyone to raise their hands, for those that want to move forward with Christ, to come to the altar and let the deacons pray with you. Begin to move. As I pray for all of you. Father God, we are so grateful that God, during these dark times, that we don't have to experience your hand of aggression or anger, that God is during those times that you desire to draw us the closest to you and heal us. I pray, Father, that you would do just that, that you would begin the healing of those that are going through those difficult times. God, I pray your hand upon Father God, into your hand we commit this time. In Jesus' name. Here's what I'm going to ask you. As we stand to sing, yeah, if you pray to receive Christ, come talk to me right now. If you're one of those that raise your hand that you're in a dry place, listen, there's no sweeter, more gracious group of people that I'd rather have put their arm around me and help me through this time this group right here. Maybe God's leading you to come join this church or be baptized. You come by faith. See, that's what that is. is that is you putting your faith in Jesus as you trust God in those areas. Let's stand this morning. Those that need to respond, respond. The rest of us, let's pray and let's worship the Lord as we watch Him move.